From August 16, 1944 onward, it became apparent that there was a pocket forming around us in the Falaise area. Everyone now attempted to escape into the east. The once orderly retreat turned into chaotic flight. The infantry divisions were supplied almost entirely with horse-drawn vehicles, and so we saw a multitude of carts congesting the roads. Between them walked the wounded and demoralized soldiers. Allied fighter-bomber attacks became more intense by the day, and everything around us descended into chaos, destruction, and death. As for our own unit, we tried to make our withdrawal with leapfrog maneuvers. My SPGs took a position and covered the Grenadier Company's movement, then the latter was covering us and we withdrew past its position. Then, one night, we lost communications with each other, and our 8th Company was now completely alone again. From August 17 to 18, the situation grew increasingly worse. The enemy kept attacking from Falaise in the direction of Troon. This led to German panzer divisions standing in the west, becoming huddled into each other more and more. For them, the way east was not at all an easy one. They had to cross the River Orne on their retreat, behind which another obstacle awaited them, namely the River Dives. Masses of men and materiel were building up on and around the bridges. Allied aircraft and artillery were bombarding these concentrations constantly, making any form of progress almost completely impossible. Each formation now attempted to break out on its own. Every man was fighting for his immediate comrades and nothing else. Within our company, too, feelings of desperation became more prevalent. Fuel was almost impossible to get. The masses crowded the roads and vehicle after vehicle had to be left behind by ourselves as well. In the end, I only had my two self-propelled guns remaining. In the morning of August 19th, we were positioned roughly three miles west of St. Lambert. Runner communications with regimental command had ceased several days before. Judging from what reports we were getting over the course of the day, we concluded that the Allies must have managed to tighten the pocket to a few kilometres already, albeit only loosely. We were in danger of getting cut off completely. Battalion command now tasked me with re-establishing communications with our regimental command post south of Trun. It had to be somewhere a few miles behind us. To this end I procured a motorcycle, which had been standing in the middle of the street, apparently left behind by its former owner. My men saw to it that its fuel tank was full, and shortly before dark set in, I set out alone. Wanting to avoid the congested roads as much as possible, I went across country at breakneck speed, Time and again I had to stop and orientate myself. What I witnessed was an inferno beyond any description. On the meadows around me were countless groups of soldiers, dozens at a time, either wounded or already dead. Between them lay dead horses, stood carriages, trucks, ambulances, guns, tanks, or armoured cars. Many vehicles were ablaze, spewing oily smoke into the air. Sometime after nightfall, I eventually found our regiment's command post south of Troon. Lieutenant Colonel Rauch appeared to be crestfallen. An advance by the Canadian 4th Armoured Division from Falaise towards Treur had split our division right in the middle. Our regiment stood south and southwest of the village of Troon, and was in danger of being ultimately cut off by the next Canadian push southwards. The battle groups of 21st Panzer Division now had orders to attempt to break through into the east on their own. Battle Group von Luck, meaning Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125, had commenced its breakout the day before, and Battle Group Oppeln had followed that day, August 19th. Our own Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, Battle Group Rauch, was to begin its breakout attempt in the night before August 20th. The regimental command post was now hastily readied for the march. When I reported to Rauch and asked for further orders for his 2nd Battalion, he at first could not believe that I was actually standing before him. Hola! he exclaimed. Where in all the world did you come from? Rauch explained to me that he had already been informed that our battalion had been wiped out. Apparently one company had been mistaken for our whole battalion. Rauch now wanted to withdraw eastwards with the remains of his regiment as per his orders. He ordered me to drive back to my battalion and relay these orders immediately to Major Lenz. The new rallying point for Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192 was to be Saint Lambert. There, the pocket was apparently not closed, and it seemed that breaking through was feasible on the road leading through this village as well as another road through Chambois, further southeast. 
It was also obvious to me that now all of our forces wanted to escape along this route. Only the quickest ones would succeed, however. I jumped back on my motorcycle and drove to the battalion. I had trouble coming through. After a few miles, I ran out of gasoline. I kept going on the road on foot for a while. On an empty stretch where the road had a bend, a German Panzer IV came towards me at high speed. I saw that it was much too fast and had the presence of mind to leap off the street, landing next to the end of a sewer pipe below it. I hurried into the pipe, and only moments later the tank's tracks burrowed into the ditch right where I had just entered it. I crawled out of the pipe through its other end and looked at the panzer lying in the ditch at a tilt. The tank's commander climbed out of the turret hatch before starting to yell and gesture in the direction of the driver, obviously furious about having effectively lost his vehicle. I turned around and stumbled along on the road. After some time, I discovered an abandoned Kettenkrad standing on the roadside and drove on with it. I eventually arrived at the battalion. There, all hope had already been abandoned. Major Lenz had assembled all remaining officers around him. I reported to him, which he acknowledged stoically. It was apparent that an orderly retreat was barely possible amidst all this chaos. Nevertheless, he issued commands for all to rally at Saint-Lambert. We would attempt to initially break out together. In case any unit would get separated from the rest, however, each company commander was to try reaching Saint-Lambert with his remaining men on his own. The Major ordered me to take his adjutant, Lieutenant Schulze, and drive ahead on the tracked motorcycle to reconnoitre the way toward Saint-Lambert. Since I was already familiar with the route, I was to take the lead— Mayolens ordered the companies to arrange in a marching order. Eighth Company, with my two self-propelled guns, was again tasked with forming a rear guard. I bade farewell to First Lieutenant Bratz. We wished each other godspeed, and together with his runner he returned to our company on a sidecar motorcycle. Like with most men of our company, I would never see him again. Late in the evening of August 19, 1944, we went on the march to Saint-Lambert. The roads were completely covered in vehicles standing in two or three columns immediately next to each other. Many of these were burning or already wrecked. Artillery shells were striking continuously. Ammunition and fuel was exploding everywhere around. In the midst were streams of soldiers slowly making their way. Tanks were ablaze. Horses lay on their back, their legs thrashing about in their death throes. We came across ambulance cars which had burned up while they were full of wounded. Horribly mutilated, their charred corpses lay inside the wrecks and on the ground before it. After just a short time, Lieutenant Schultz and I had already lost contact to our battalion. There was nothing to be done. All around us, the chaotic masses pushed onward. Eventually, we arrived at the centre of Saint-Lambert, where we found a command post that was apparently trying to coordinate the breakout. There I saw something unforgettable. Two German generals sitting on crates right among all the bustle. We were told that they were commanders of two infantry divisions who had lost contact with their respective units. Both of the two SS Panzer Division's vanguards had already succeeded in breaking through towards Vimontius, and every man able to do so was following in their tracks. Since Lieutenant Schulze and I had no more contact with our battalion whatsoever, we decided to join up with 10th SS Panzer Division Frunsberg. Its soldiers seemed to us to be still undeterred, and their vigorous demeanour looked promising when it came to making it out of the pocket. Just like our unit, 10th SS Panzer Division had arrived at Saint-Lambert in the morning hours of August 20th. In the afternoon, the breakout attempt was to be made, following the lead of the other two SS Panzer Divisions which had gone before. Within a column of armoured vehicles, we went on the march in the afternoon of August 20th. Burning wrecks on the road were ruthlessly pushed to the side by the panzers. Several Type V Panther tanks were at the tip, with armoured personnel carriers and infantry on foot behind them. I also saw the two generals in the middle of it all. The streets and ditches were littered with countless dead and wounded. We took with us whoever we could, but the heavy tank tracks mercilessly ran over the dead on the road. A disturbing sight beyond all description which will forever leave a scar on my mind. Some artillery shells struck nearby. Everyone ducked for a moment, but the march went on. Our vanguard was caught in a firefight with enemy anti-tank guns further down the road, but these were successfully defeated. Finally, we crossed the Divas and entered the area east of St. Lambert, where we dug in around midnight. Jumping off the APCs, we secured the surrounding terrain. 
I was impressed by how disciplined the Waffen-SS soldiers were conducting themselves. Most of them were still quite young fellows, but something in their faces made them look like old men. What a difference between them and the regular infantry division's soldiers. We stayed until around Old Two Tanchlauser of August 21st before setting off again. Marching on at walking pace, we walked to the left and right of the armoured vehicles, ready to immediately react to a possible ambush. Many of the wounded were at the end of their tether. There was too little room to carry them, and as such, more than a few were left behind. With the break of dawn, heavy artillery fire started coming in. The pocket behind us had to be the site of horrible Carnegie. The realization we had made it out of St. Lambert was truly elating. After more skirmishes with enemy tanks and anti-tank guns, we eventually arrived at the positions of 2nd and 9th SS Panzer Division's 2nd SS Panzer Corps, southwest of Vimoutier. After their successful breakout, these two divisions had commenced a counter-offensive, which had contributed to our own breakout's success in a considerable way. Thanks to their pressure, the attacks on use had remained limited in scope. Completely exhausted, we now finally had a few hours of rest. It was hard to believe that we had actually managed to escape this hellscape of death and perdition. The tenseness of the days before now started to fade, and everyone, be they a humble soldier or proud general, was glad to have survived and to have made it through. Retreat East After our successful escape, everyone hurried towards the River Seine. Back on August 21st, 1944, Army Group B had ordered a general retreat behind this large stream. For the time being, we assembled what was left of our 21st Panzer Division between Bellu and Fervacs. Individual regiments were down to 30% of their original strength and had barely any heavy weaponry left. Lieutenant Schulzer and I asked our way and eventually found the rally point of our 192nd Panzer Grenadier Regiment. The regiment had been one of the last formations to escape the pocket and had been weakened the most. Divisional command had thus given provisional orders to rally at Saint-Germain-la-Campagne and remain in reserve. When the lieutenant and I reported at the rally point, we were welcomed by Colonel Rausch. He had been promoted in the meantime. Visibly glad to see us, Rausch quickly briefed us on the general situation. It did not look all too well. The losses suffered inside the pocket were neither quantifiable nor even conceivable. The next big problem was that now the entirety of Army Group B had to cross the Seine. Our regimental staff had been decimated during the fighting retreat. I was the only lieutenant to have been part of the regiment right from the beginning of the Normandy landings. Some of the other subaltern positions had to be replaced up to seven times. Colonel Rauch made a surprisingly long time for me. After he had dismissed Schulze, he asked me to sit down for a moment. Hurler, he commenced his address in his characteristic fatherly tone. I already know you since 1943. I always saw you as a very capable, industrious, and most of all courageous officer. So what would you say if you were to switch from a career as reserve officer to active officer duty? I was staggered. I had not expected that. In the time during and shortly after the breakout, I had gotten the chance to think about many things— we had escaped along with the soldiers of the 10th SS Panzer Division, and I had conversed with them a lot. During these conversations, I would often compare these Waffen-SS soldiers to our regular army men. The fact that our replacements were of lower and lower quality, while at the same time the ranks of the Waffen-SS seemed to be filled with expertly trained soldiers gave me pause. The levels of training and motivation within our division were only a shadow of what they had been back in 1941 during the Africa campaign. Back then, all soldiers had been confident and capable fighters almost without exception. This kind of vigour could not have been eluded. Even in Tunisia in 1942, everyone had still been full of conviction. Now, in the year 1944, it appeared to me that most of the time, many were only following orders apathetically. I had to admit that this change of mind had not happened within the ranks of the Waffen-SS. During the unfathomably chaotic escape out of the Falaise pocket, soldiers of the Waffen-SS showed a level of mutual support and camaraderie that left me utterly impressed. Deep inside, I even envied them for their proudly displayed will to persevere, their still first-rate discipline and, most of all, their internal solidarity. After all these months of turmoil, it seemed quite enticing. 
But of what use was this perseverance in the face of the sheer superhuman enemy superiority? I was still convinced to be standing on the right side, but last three months' events had not left me unchanged. Events like the July assassination attempt left me thinking, and for a long time I had been contemplating the rationale behind this world war. However, the demand for unconditional surrender, which the Allies had stated during their 1943 Casablanca conference, had left many of us more determined than before, including myself. Should we surrender ourselves to a return to the infamy that the 1920s and 1930s had been for Austria and Germany? To me, this was unacceptable. Better to end or all this fighting to the very end than having to suffer the same way as one's parents. But what would this very end be? How would it look like? I could not know. I tried to talk myself into believing that everything that had been accomplished over the last few years could not have been in vain. In what short moments of respite I got. I always found myself conflicted about these issues. Anyway, when the officers of the 10th SS Panzers asked me to join them, I was indeed tempted to give in to their solicitation. Only after the war would I learn of the war crimes committed by the Waffen SS, not just the General SS and Totenkopf Death's Head formations who were responsible for the genocide happening inside the concentration camps, but fighters of the Waffen SS had just as well incurred a great guilt during their combat operations. Besides, there was another thing about which I was thinking a lot. During my time with 21st Panzer Division, I had sensed a difference in how I was treated by my superiors. I was under the impression that active duty officers were given many more opportunities to further their career compared to us, reserve officers. While this was certainly not the case in all of the German army, my personal experience in the hard-fought battles of Normandy had led me to believe it personally. Again and again, I was assigned special missions, while active duty officers, some of whom had higher ranks, were not burdened that much. This left me disillusioned and somewhat resentful, and it actually convinced me to return to civilian life as soon as possible right after the war. As Colonel Rauch was now sitting before me and making this offer, all of these thoughts went through my head. As a matter of fact, his sincere and honest approach had impressed me, and in any case his offer made me resolve for myself to stay true to my division. I hoped that some of the men under my command had made it out of the fillet's pocket, and I wanted to lead them through the horrors of war as good as I could. I simply owed it to my soldiers. Near the end of our conversation, Colonel Rauch eventually shook his head and ended by saying, Well, Hola, I understand, but I ask that you don't take too much time to decide this. In any case, I see a future career officer in you. I will in the near future see to it that you will be assigned to my staff. As soon as replacements from home reach us, you will come to me. For the time being, you stay with 2nd Battalion. Right now, I need every good officer, and as far forward as possible at that. I will also push on with your promotion. If everything goes well, you will be 1st Lieutenant by October 1st. Then things will look different again. Also, there's still time after the war to think about your activation. He then ordered me to report back with my battalion commander, and with that, I was dismissed. I signed off, leaving the command post without any further comment. Major Lenz had indeed managed to escape with the survivors of our 2nd Battalion. I found our unit, or rather what was left of it, without much of a problem. The soldiers were housed very close by. I reported back to Lenz, who was already completely occupied with bringing his unit back into a somewhat battle-ready state. He also looked surprised when he saw me enter. I was tasked by him to assemble and make ready for action a reconnaissance platoon, which was to be held ZBV, meaning Zur Besonderen Verwendung for Special Deployment. Its purpose was to give the battalion the most possible freedom of action and also prevent the few men that were left being lost in an unsuspected attack. Once there were only little forces available, good reconnaissance became increasingly valuable. The Major allowed me to choose my men for myself. I just had to make sure we were ready for action. To my great joy, I found one of my self-propelled guns, along with its crew. There was much cheering as we greeted each other. I was told that our company had been torn apart in the mayhem of the pocket. The second self-propelled gun had received a direct hit by enemy tank fire and burned up, along with its crew. None of them had made it. 
other soldiers from my platoon had gone missing in the pocket. With that, this vehicle crew was all that had made it out. A whole five soldiers were left of my anti-tank platoon. There was no trace of First Lieutenant Bratz or the other platoons from our 8th Company as well. They were assumed to be either dead or captured. Only some time later did some men of the grenade launcher and anti-air platoons trickle in. They reported that the first lieutenant had most probably been captured during the breakout attempt along with his runner. The two had last been seen riding a sidecar motorcycle. I sincerely hoped he had somehow made it, as he had always been a good superior. Over the last couple months we had grown closer through all the hardships we had to share. Upon request to Major Lenz, I received two small French Renault personnel carriers as well as seven Panzer Grenadier soldiers. Together with my remaining self-propelled gun, my reconnaissance platoon was now complete. Commanding the individual vehicles and their crews were three first-rate NCOs. From now on I wanted to ride along with the self-propelled gun again. After I had assembled my soldiers, I reported ready for action to Major Lenz. In the meantime, the latter had already rebuilt two Panzer Grenadier companies from those who had escaped the Falaise pocket, along with newly arrived soldiers. These companies still had very little combat power, however, and our 2nd Battalion was barely at a strength of 200 men. In the night before August 23, 1944, we marched further east, past Bernay. At the time, the danger of getting overturned by rushing Allied troops was omnipresent, and as such, the River Seine appeared to be the only sensible line of defence. In the morning of August 24, new orders reached the division. It was to relocate to the Seine south of the city of Rouen without any delay. The area there was to be held as long as possible. In addition, our division was tasked with organising the orderly crossing over the river of any forces there. Around noon on August 24, we arrived at Bourgeroux, south of Rouen, where parts of our division were again facing the Allies in battle. Their action was to buy as much time as possible for our own troops to cross the Seine. Also on August 24, 1944, French and American forces of the First Army reached Paris. The French capital, along with its Seine bridges, fell into the Liberator's hands almost undamaged on the next day. The French resistance contributed significantly to this, and as such, German resistance inside the city itself was very limited. In the evening of August 24th, we finally reached Rouen and the River Seine. Between here and the sea, there was not a single bridge across the river still intact. All of them had been destroyed by repeated Allied air attacks. The only option left were French civilian ferries, a portion of which were operated by the German Kriegsmarine. Around their landing stages, retreating German formations were amassing once more. The Allied menace in the air turned crossing the river into a dangerous endeavour. Panzer Pioneer Battalion 220, 220th Armoured Engineer Battalion was now tasked with repairing the Damaged Railroad Bridge in Rouen. Our regiment was ordered not to wait, but immediately cross this bridge, as our Toon Battalion was at the tip of the regiment. Me and my reconnaissance platoon had to scout the area around our crossing. The railroad bridge was indeed in a severely damaged condition. Heavy bombs had brought it to the brink of collapse. Only a single lane was still negotiable, which was already congested by a multitude of Waffen-SS vehicles that had begun their crossing a while before. During nightfall, we investigated the bridge on foot. One man stayed behind at the bridge's end to serve as messenger, while me and an NCO boarded a Waffen-SS APC and went up to the bridge's midpoint. There we dismounted and got an overview of the situation. The middle part of the bridge had been made somewhat drivable by laying wooden posts and boards across the railroad tracks. Crossing with our vehicles would be a difficult task, but still a feasible one. As long as we guided the vehicles very carefully, it could be done. I sent a man back to report our findings, and as a matter of fact we managed to cross the bridge with the entirety of battle group Rauch. First we queued up among the seemingly endless columns of Waffen-SS troops before, long after midnight and several arduous hours of anxiously feeling forward step by step later, we finally reached the other side. Luckily for us, not a single vehicle got stuck on the bridge, which would have caused a traffic jam and massive delays. Once on the other side, we went eastwards through the streets of Rouen, a city that was by now completely in ruins. Fires were raging everywhere, all these destroyed houses, 
some of which were utterly ablaze, made for a scene that was as eerie as it was terrifying. We left the city behind us in the black of night, and after a few more hours of driving, we eventually arrived at Beauvais, roughly thirty-five miles east of Rouen. There, we set up camp in a bushy patch of terrain outside town before finally falling asleep with much exhaustion. As we would later find out, we had been quite lucky again, as the bridge was ultimately destroyed by an air attack on the very next day. It does not bear contemplating what would have happened if we had been right on the bridge at that moment. Fortune had again favoured us. From Beauvais, our journey went on to Compiègne. Crossing this small town left us all in a contemplative mood. On November 11, 1918, in a railroad car parked in the woods near Compiègne, the armistice which ended World War I had been signed. Twenty-two years later, June 22, 1940, France had signed its formal capitulation to Germany at this very same place. Hitler had arranged it, knowing full well about the location's relevance. Now, four years later, we crossed this important town as an army defeated, and nobody dared to think about how this railroad car might soon be in use again, this time perhaps under the same circumstances as in the fall of 1918. Despite this small village's historic significance, we did not stop or try to look for the railroad car. There was no point in it. We had to get ahead. On the march east, we learned that the Allies in southern France had made rapid progress after their landings. Much like the American and British armies in northern France, they kept on rushing forward. We acknowledged the report with much indifference, as we would not have expected for our own forces to stop this advance. All our thoughts were now fixed on Germany and its border. We were convinced that if we managed to reach it, we could halt the Allies there. Rumours were making the rounds that a massive line of fortifications had been constructed at the old German border, which we would be integrated into. In addition, it would be no later than there that the civilian population would welcome us with open arms again. It occurred to none of us that these people might be just as war-weary as we were ourselves. Major Lenz told us that our depleted battle group Rauch was to receive replacements at Reims, roughly ninety miles east of Paris. By August 28th, 1944, we had arrived at this area, at all times followed closely by Allied troops. As such, we also did not stay at Reims for long. Allied pressure was simply too much. We were told that our 21st Panzer Division was from now on subject to German Army Group G. A new battle group consisting of two Panzer Grenadier Battalions, a combat engineer battalion as well as an armoured artillery detachment, was to immediately transfer via Metz into the Nancy area. The units selected for this mission were 1st Battalion, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, Feldersatz Bataillon 200, Panzer Pionier Bataillon 220, as well as 2nd Detachment of Panzer Artillery Regiment 155. Me and my reconnaissance platoon were also assigned to this battle group, much to the chagrin of my battalion commander, who did not want to lose his reconnaissance capabilities again. But orders were orders. Together with my men, I signed off and left 2nd Battalion behind. So our journey took us from Reims further into the east. While the Americans took the city already on August 28th, the last parts of our division only crossed the Seine at Rouen one full day later. We drove by day and night, always spreading out as much as possible. By day we always looked out for enemy aircraft, which scoured in the sky like wasps searching for rotten fruit. On some occasions we only managed to disappear in the undergrowth mere moments before a plane passed by. We would also see a new type of aircraft which we had not recognised before. American twin-engine twin-boom fighters called P-38 Lightning. These we soon nicknamed Fork-Tailed Devils. Like the single-engine P-51 Mustang, they had auxiliary fuel tanks enabling them to operate far behind enemy lines on the ground. And this they did with much success as evidenced by the many burnt-out vehicles we were passing on our route. Many of these wrecks had charred corpses still inside them. No one had the time to bury the dead. We avoided the main lines of movement, opting for side roads as much as was feasible. Getting enough supply of fuel worked surprisingly well on our march. Only ammunition was short. On August 30th, 1944, we passed Verdun and drove further towards Nancy. There we could again see increased activity by the French resistance movement. 
we learned that there had been multiple attacks on our communication lines over the days before. Most of all, our forces had been raided by the resistance in the vicinity of Luneville. After that, Waffen-SS units had combed the area, but failed to score any success against the French. We spent the night in a village, and in the morning we found the streets littered with three-pointed forged metal caltrops. Colonel Rauch had a discussion with the mayor, and within an hour the caltrops were gone again. It was obvious that the local population feared reprisals from our side. To ward of bad surprises, we kept up full combat readiness on our march. We did not want to risk running into an ambush. By the first September days, we stood in the area north of Epinal, a town roughly ninety miles southwest of Strasbourg. This meant that we were not far from Germany, as Strasbourg can be considered a border city. By now, Allied troops had already reached the Belgian capital of Brussels. Our 21st Panzer Division was in an extremely poor condition. A report issued by the division staff estimated that the division was down to a strength between 6,000 and 8,000 men. More accurate assessments could not be made, as individual units and formations had been forced back on their retreat as far as Aachen. There were no tanks that could still be reported as operational, only one or two Sturmgeschütze, assault guns as well as a few anti-aircraft guns and artillery pieces, nothing more than that. In Alsace-Lorraine we turned back west again for the first time in a while. Our battle group received orders to immediately reconnoitre from Nancy along the Moselle River in the direction of Epinal, and determine whether the enemy had already crossed the Moselle. Following that, we were to secure the area and thus create the prerequisites for a planned 5th Panzer Armee attack westward. Beginning September 5th, 1944, we commenced feeling our way forward from our starting point south of Nancy, going further south. The first few days passed by without enemy contact. In the windows of the villages we passed, however, were at all times scared faces staring at us. Some streets had already been solemnly decorated, obviously in anticipation of the arrival of the Americans. Most French had not expected to now witness German forces driving through their home village again. We ignored the whole situation, passing through with a stone-still and grim expression. In the village of Châtel-sur-Moselle, north of Epinal, we halted and made camp. Here, too, the streets were decorated with flower bouquets. As we billeted ourselves in a barn, the locals told us once being asked, and only after some hesitation, that a few hours before an American scouting patrol had entered the village. They had already withdrawn westward again, however. After leaving châtel sur moselle the next day, we turned westward ourselves and cautiously drove towards the surmised American spearheads. On September 8th, we arrived at Meyer Court, roughly 13 miles west of châtel sur moselle It was here that we would again come into contact with Allied troops. This contact did not come as a surprise, as we were on the alert. The local civilians' reports about the approaching Americans made us proceed with extraordinary caution. Before entering a new village, we would first observe it from a safe distance. In addition, we always tried to allocate forces to our direct support. This effort would pay off at Meyer Court, as shortly before we would have entered town, we spotted an American M8 Greyhound armoured scout car covering a street. Its 37 mm main gun, as well as its heavy point .50 machine gun, posed a serious threat as such. This threat had to be neutralised as soon as possible. We slowly drove our self-propelled gun into a favourable shooting position. Everyone's nerves were extremely strained, but still they all did their part with great zeal. Now we finally had a chance to strike back. In a village house's backyard, we found a good position to engage at around 1,000 feet. The enemy scout car was well camouflaged and covered by a small wall up to the height of its turret ring. Hitting it in such a position would be difficult. The American himself, on the other hand, could not get a bead on us. This we could see by how far his gun was elevated. It was a standoff. I now sent one of my runners to one of my trucks, ordering the latter to roll forward on the road slowly and for all to see. When that truck arrived, prudently with only the lone driver inside, my plan came to fruition. The Americans at once took our bait, and as the armoured scout car slowly went forward to open fire on the truck, I shouted, Fire! With a loud bang, our shell left the barrel, striking the armoured car at the rear. Smoke emerged. I ordered an explosive shell be loaded and fired at will. The scout car was still able to move under its own power, however, hastily rolling back behind a group of bushes. 
Our second shot missed. To us it was now as clear as day. Soon we would come under artillery fire or be hunted by fighter bombers. Things we did not want to find ourselves in. As such, I gave the order to withdraw, and we leapfrogged back behind the next ridge. We quickly covered several miles until arriving at Sham, a town at the Moselle's River. Here, too, were decorated streets and people looking at us anxiously. The fact that we had engaged the American vanguard without any casualties made us euphoric. Happily waving at the surprised French, we crossed the town at maximum speed. Once arrived at battalion command, I gave my report, which was acknowledged without any further measures taken. Our side had too few troops available to do anything meaningful. In all likelihood, the Moselle's crossings would soon fall into American hands. Merely part of our 16th Infantry Division were strewn across multiple bases in the area. Between their positions, however, were none of our forces. By September 10th, 1944, the Allies pushed their troops forward again. To this end, German Panzer Brigade 112, with its Panzer V Panther and Panzer IV tanks, were now to conduct a first limited attack into the area west of Epinal. Our battle group was also assigned to this unit for the duration of the attack. Since Colonel Rauch had fallen ill, Colonel von Luck, regimental commander of Panzer Grenadier, Regiment 1 to 25, took over command of the now called Battle Group von Luck. It was further reinforced by 2nd Battalion of the 125th Panzer Grenadiers. The planned attack west of Epinal ended in catastrophe. When the Americans and French of 15 Army Corps identified our staging areas west of Dompere and Epinal, as well as detecting the beginning advance of 112th Brigade's brand new German panzers, they lost no time. On September 13th, they destroyed a total of almost 70 German tanks with concentrated air attacks and artillery fire. As a result, 112th Panzer Brigade's attack was already over before it had started at all. Our battle group was now to conduct a limited counterattack to cover the retreat of the remains of the brigade. Thus, we advanced from Epinal in the direction of Dompere. There was a fierce meeting engagement with the tanks of French 2nd Armoured Division, which were themselves advancing from the Darni area. On September 12th already, the French had crossed the Moselle at Cham. We were now drawn back towards Epinal. These engagements left us at a total strength of only 600 to 700 men and a few guns. Going in an arc over Rambavillas, we transferred northward towards Luneville. Now the plan was for German forces to establish a defensive line along the river Mürde. The Americans were faster, however, taking Luneville on September 16, 1944, along with its Mürte crossings. This meant another change of plans for the Wehrmacht. After the catastrophic failure of Panzer, Brigade 1-12 west of Epinal, Army Group G ordered another attack. This wish was not to be denied. The conditions for this planned offensive just became more and more difficult, however. Again, consolidated elements of our 21st Panzer Division and Brigade 112, now called Battle Group Feuchtinger, were to advance along with Panzer Brigades 111 and 113, as well as remains of 15th Panzer Grenadier Division from the Baccarat area in the direction of Luneville. In the night before September 17, 1944, we readied ourselves for this attack. On the ride to our staging area, I had a rare, exhilarating experience for a change. As we went through a village, a cow suddenly ran on the street right in front of our vehicle. I sat in the first of our two Renault trucks when in the blink of an eye, this cow came out from behind a bush, standing right in our vehicle's way. My driver could not brake in time, such that we rammed the animal at full tilt. The poor cow was hurled on top of our hood by the impact from which it slid down again once we had come to a halt mooing loudly. Without serious injury, the animal trotted off. We were as startled as we were dumbfounded. I did not want to leave a bad impression. After all, I was quite aware that, especially in rural areas like this, losing a single cow could end in a family having to starve. We were somewhat ahead of the others, so me and the driver spontaneously went to the close by Farmstead. I was intent on offering the French farmer my apologies for our accident with the cow. In the steed's yard, there was a little girl staring at use with a start, and a moment later the farmer himself came running toward us, gesturing loudly. He was obviously fearing for his child as he knelt down and embraced the girl tightly, scowling at us. 
He then slowly pushed the child behind his own body. I now attempted to explain to him that we had possibly hurt one of his cows, but to no avail. My French was obviously bad, and after the first few sentences the farmer apparently believed we had come to appropriate his car when he opened the barn doors and showed us the car without being asked to. We realized that we could not hope to communicate. We gestured to make him understand that everything was fine, and closing with the words, Pardon la vache, apologies, the cow, we took to our heels. We left behind a more than confused French farmer who was probably happy to be still in possession of his vehicle, and who almost certainly had no clue what cow these two Germans had been talking about. In the morning of September 18th, our attack commenced according to plan, and indeed we made swift progress until noon. When we crossed through Baccarat in the direction of Luneville, however, Allied P-38 Lightning Fighters spotted us and swooped down on us. Their attack only took seconds to manifest. We had not heard the aircraft on their approach due to the noise of our own engines, and our air observes could not spot them in time. When they turned to face us and closed in, it was already too late. We saw muzzle flashes below the enemy two-engine craft's cockpits, and a moment later small fountains of dirt were racing towards us. I was still with one of my trucks, whose driver was quick-witted enough to steer the Renault into a small patch of brushwork. We jumped off the vehicle and pressed ourselves into the road ditch. All were now expecting bombs to explode, but none of that happened. The fighters circled us for several more times before flying off again. I gave the order to mount up again and find out whether there had been casualties. After a few minutes I received a dire report. The chief gunner of my self-propelled gun had fallen victim to one of the enemy fighter's salvos. After spotting the aircraft, the entire crew had reacted correctly, but the sergeant had been just a moment too slow and jumped right into a burst of fire. He had died on the spot. I despondently acknowledged the news and made the men mount up again. Once more, death had come to haunt us, and, like most times, it had come surprisingly and without a warning. I secured the right flank with my reconnaissance platoon, and we advanced from Baccarat in a northwestern direction without further incidents. We first crossed the river Meurthe, and by evening we already stood at Zermanenil, south of Luneville. Here, protected by the village, we halted for the time being. But the pressure exerted by the Americans to our north and the French further west became more and more intense. In the morning of September 19th, 1944, the fortunes of war turned against us. The Allies launched a counterattack. To this end, American units had taken up elevated positions at Luneville the night before, such that by dawn we found that they had direct sight of our own position. Single American tanks were now firing shell upon shell into the area they could overlook. We were trapped. As soon as one of our vehicles showed itself, it became the target of intense fire. We attempted identifying the enemy tanks and opening fire ourselves. This worked to some degree, although we could not hope to get out more than three to five inaccurate and hastily fired shells. Nobody wanted to make themselves seen by enemy spotters for too long. We knew all too well that the American tank's gunners were only waiting for us to show up. Every time our shots were detected immediately and followed by intense counterfire. We rapidly switched to a new position and tried again from there, the same result. Over the course of several hours, shells kept striking around us in irregular intervals. We never had the chance to score an exact hit. One Panzer V Panther tank of Panzer Brigade 112 tried to change position and failed to avoid the area visible to the enemy. When it closed in on a road junction that had come under fire multiple times, each of us expected the tank to be hit directly. All of a sudden, a young Panzer grenadier jumped out of the roadside ditch, stood up in the middle of the road and put up his arms right in front of the lumbering vehicle. The tank's driver stepped on the brakes, such that the whole vehicle tilted slightly forward from the abrupt deceleration. A second later, the brave infantryman was already gone again, followed immediately by the staggering detonation of an enemy anti-tank projectile right in the middle of the junction, the panther's commander, realizing the impending danger, slowly backed up into the protection of nearby houses. There was no getting forward here. The entire area was visible to our enemy. Further in the front around Mortagne, Allied pressure became overbearing, and in the evening we eventually received the order to withdraw. To this end, the armored units of Panzer Brigade 112 diverted into the woods south of Luneville. 
Driving from cover to cover, we followed them. During our departure, we had yet another lucky moment. The hours before I had spent with my self-propelled gun, to which we had hooked on a small trailer that we used to stow equipment, but also ammunition. We had procured this trailer only a short time earlier. When we turned around a house corner and crossed the road at full speed, an explosion tore apart our trailer right behind our backs. An enemy shell had missed us just by a fraction of a second and hit the trailer. Apart from the hitch, nothing was left of it. We found that, in light of us all surviving this incident, it was an acceptable loss. Finally, during nightfall, we were able to escape over a meadowland. In the night before September 20th, 1944, we withdrew further back. In the dark of night, we managed to go back across the River Murtha by a very narrow margin. While wading through the water, we suddenly sank into a deep hole and ended up with the vehicle's hood underwater. In the pitch black, we feared for a moment to sink entirely, but much to our luck, we remained half above the waterline, and only the engine had stalled. We managed to win over the commander of a panther tank that was also fording the river. Underwater, we fixed two steel cables to our self-propelled gun, and after a single hitch, we were free again. The panther continued towing us until we entered a nearby forest, where we spent the entire rest of the night getting the engine to run again. Finally, as the sun was about to rise, we did it. The engine started. The panther tank that had took us out of that wet mess had been one of only a few of 112th Brigade's panzers to successfully cross the Murth. Apart from them, the brigade had to leave behind almost its entire remaining vehicle inventory. We hastily formed a defensive line along the Murth between Luneville and Baccarat. In essence, this meant that we initially secured possible river crossings. My two Renault trucks had also made it across the river, and after repairing our self-propelled gun, we joined the mass of withdrawing units on the way back to Baccarat. Once again, we had suffered losses in battle, and of the almost 700 soldiers of the former battle group Rauch, only half of that number was still capable of fighting. With all that, the counterattack had ultimately failed. The front lines now hardened into a gentle arc from Luneville over Baccarat to Rambusvillers and Epinal. To our benefit, the Americans and French had to first reorganize their forces, and things were somewhat calm for a moment. Before Colonel Rauch had transferred command to Colonel von Luck, there had been one final conversation between us, in which he had also announced that he was to give up command due to illness. Still, he wanted to stay true to his words, and thus told me that, after the conclusion of our attack, I was to be assigned adjutant to the commander of his 1st Battalion, Captain Werner Reitzer. I was to stay with Reitzer until Rauch's return and a reassignment into the regimental staff envisioned for me. Rauch also let me know he had arranged for me to become an active officer. In case I had any objections against that, I would still be able to change my mind at the end of the war. Since the failed attacks at Epinal and Luneville were now over, I reported to 1st Battalion, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, on September 21st. My reconnaissance platoon was disbanded and integrated into the battalion. With that, I had no more direct subordinates to command. One last time, I talked to my men, wished them all the best, and that they would come home in good health. Taking our farewells really was hard for us all too long had we been serving close together. Counting myself, only five were still remaining, not more. The rest were either dead, missing, or had been captured. It would only be a matter of time until I would meet such a fate as well.